I'm going to be talking about the theory of evolution, um, which is really, for me, the, uh, the cement that unites the whole of biology into one glorious edifice. But for most of the world's population, it's something they find very, uh, very unpalatable. Maybe they're even frightened of it, perhaps because it alters their views of themselves. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to ask, is man, Homo sapiens, just another animal? In 18... Um, 52, uh, Queen Victoria of England uh, went to London Zoo and there she saw in a cage an uh, orangutan. We all know what an orangutan is and she wrote in her diary that day, the, orang the, orangutan, the orangutan is strongly and persistently and fearfully human. And she could see, even before the idea of evolution had come around, um, that uh, actually the orangutan looked rather like a human being. And she didn't like the idea at all. Now, a few years earlier, actually, Charles Darwin had been to the same zoo and had visited that orangutan's mother. They were both, as it happened, called Jenny. And he'd noted the similarity with humans in his, uh, in his notebooks. And that too was before he came up with the theory of evolution, um, which he, he finally published, of course, in 1859 in The Origin of Species. And uh, he published The Origin of Species in 1859, and it's a wonderful book. It's a book, really, which deserves reading, because it's so carefully planned. He called it One Long Argument. In the first chapter, he talks about something obvious. We all know to be true, that you can change animals on the farm by breeding from them. You can get milk cattle and dairy cattle, for example, um, just by breeding from cattle that produce lots of milk and others that produce lots of beef. Um, and everybody knows that. And then slowly he moves through the book until finally, just two pages from the end, he dares say that light will be cast upon man and his origins. And he didn't dare to say any more because he knew that would cause an uproar, which it did. Uh, there was a great row in 1859, um, mainly because people felt, or many people felt, the church certainly felt, um, that what this did was to drag us down to the level of the apes. And if we're going to be dragged down to the level of the apes, why should we not behave like apes? Why should we have civilization at all? Um, now that seems to us a very foolish idea today. And in fact, it's, it went away quite, quite uh, quickly from European thought. Uh, most uh, Christians on, in Europe, and most, uh, many members of other religions too, are quite happy to accept the theory of evolution. But that's not true in places like the United States, where they really will not accept that theory because it removes the uniqueness of being human. It makes us into just another animal. It's actually had some practical effects, which I find a bit uh, disturbing. Uh, quite recently, the very famous primatologist called Jane Goodall, who many people may have heard of, who spent most of her life in Africa studying chimp behavior, and is a remarkable woman, she's in her 70s now, and she went out to Africa um, 50 years ago with almost no training and spent her life living with chimpanzees and gorillas, okay? um, chimpanzees mainly in fact. And she studied their behavior, and they're quite dangerous animals, and she's made some large um, uh, progress in that. But she came up with an observation, which was made a few years ago, that chimpanzees and humans share about 98% of their DNA in common. Uh, it's actually a bit less than that, but initially it was said 98%. And Jane Goodall came up with exactly the argument that had been used against Darwin, that they, they must be 98% human then. Okay. And she managed to push through the uh, courts in many European countries and in the United States uh, a rule um, that said you cannot carry out experiments upon chimpanzees. Now, uh, uh, animal experiments are a different issue, which I don't want to talk about, but you can, under very strict conditions, you can experiment on any animal except for a chimpanzee. And that's because, Jane Goodall and many people think, it's almost human. My case is exactly the opposite. What I think, actually, is that chimpanzees may share 98% of our DNA, but they're not 98% human. In fact, they're not human at all. And that's what I want to explore in the rest of this lecture. So let's just remind ourselves what Darwin's theory is. It's very, very simple. He summarized it himself. Evolution is descent with modification. Descent, the passage of information from one generation to the next. Modification, the fact that that passage of information is uh, less than perfect, there are mistakes. Um, and uh, we can summarize it in three even simpler words. Evolution is genetics plus time. DNA, copying DNA, and mutations. And errors will build up. And uh, Darwin often used analogies from language. And you can see evolution at work in language. English and French 
of very similar languages. Uh, if you can't speak both of them, they don't seem to be, but as, as, some, as a French author once said, English is only French badly pronounced. Um, English and Russian are less similar languages, but there are similarities between them. Um, and English and Chinese are very dis dissimilar languages. And you can actually see that they split apart at different times in the past. And from the books and the records, we can see that English and French began to split apart probably not much more than 3,000 years ago. English and the Russian languages began to split apart about 6,000 years ago. English and Chinese began to split apart about 20,000 years ago. So that's Evolution, descent with modification. So that's simple. You can see it happening in front of your very eyes or your very ears. But Darwin then had a better, an even better idea. He saw that there was an additional mechanism of evolution, which he called natural selection. And uh, that's inherited differences in the ability to reproduce. If you have a gene that allows you to survive, to find a mate, and to reproduce, more efficiently than the other individuals around you, be they humans or mice or flowers, then your gene will become more common in the next generation and your descendants will adapt themselves to whatever happens in the environment. And this is natural selection. I often think of it as a factory, a factory for making almost impossible things. Now, every one of us is an almost impossible thing. And one of the typically stupid arguments made by anti-evolutionists is they say, look at the human eye. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, it's almost impossible. Somebody, God up there, must have designed it. But it's not like that at all. What evolution is, and natural selection is, is a series of, of successful mistakes. And that's what the eye is. If you look at an eye, it's a ridiculous uh, piece of organization. It's like a camera with a light sensitive part of the film in an old fashioned film camera is on the wrong side of the paper. So the light has to pass through the paper before it gets to the light sensitive part. No designer would have designed that. It evolved. And ironically enough, I first came across natural selection in a factory because when I left school for, re for reasons which seemed a good idea at the time, I started training as an apprentice engineer in a soap factory. And in a soap factory, uh, to make soap powder, the way you make soap powder is to get a big vat of chemical liquid under high pressure and very hot, and you shoot it through a nozzle. And as it comes out of the nozzle with a big scream, it breaks into a, into a vapor, which is blown away and used again, and a powder, which is the soap powder. And in my day, the nozzles were about this big, and they were simply looked like that. They were just big, uh, big nozzles, simple nozzle. And they were very inefficient. And the mathematicians tried to improve them without much success. Um, so what the factory owners did is, to, without realizing it, to do an exact parallel to Darwin's natural selection. They shook 10 nozzles, they changed them at random, uh, bigger or smaller hole, longer or shorter, maybe some marks and scratches on the inside, um, and they tested them against each other. And maybe one of them was 1% better than what had gone before. So they threw the other nine away, took 10 copies of the one, changed that at random again, and within 50 or so uh, rounds, they produced an almost impossible nozzle that looked a bit like this inside. It was absolutely made no sense whatsoever, but it worked 100 times better than what had, happened, what had happened originally. Nobody designed that. Nobody needed to design that. Nobody knows why it works so much better. Nobody needs to know why it works so much better. That's natural selection. And that's widely used in computer science now. There are things called genetic algorithms, where if you want to make a very complicated computer model, you give it a lousy model, the best you can do, and then you put it in there and you tell it to change itself at random and go through it again and again, competing the various versions, and after a few thousand repeats, you get a, you get a computer program that's a hundred or a thousand times better than what went before. Like the eye, it's a complete mess, it's not elegant, but it works. And that's how they design jet engines today by Darwin's natural selection. So natural selection works. Does it work in humans? Well, the short answer is yes. We've all heard of things like sickle cell anemia, which protect against, against malaria. And malaria has only been around for about 10,000 years, so that's quite new. But there's some of them are even more dramatic. What about black people and white people? We're all Africans under the skin. You know, Africans, we're, we all evolved in Africa, but most of us have got very light skins. Why is that? Nobody used to know. Darwin strangely thought it was a kind of a sexual selection thing, that women chose men with pale skins and perhaps vice versa. But he was wrong. He was simpler than that. 
It's simply that as humans got out of Africa and moved into the terrible climates of Western Europe and Northern Russia and that kind of stuff, um, they couldn't get enough vitamin D. Okay? And vitamin D, if you don't have enough, you get rickets and all kinds of other diseases as well. But vitamin D is unique because it's the only vitamin you can make yourself. And you can make vitamin D if you go into the sun uh, with plenty of ultraviolet coming in, if that can get into your bloodstream, it will make enough vitamin D. If you take a, a Swedish baby and put it in the sun with only its face showing for an hour a day, that will give it enough vitamin D to stay healthy. But as we moved out of the sunny climate of Africa into the dreadful climate of northern and western Europe and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, northern Asia, there wasn't enough sun, and so any individual with relatively light-coloured skins um, actually survived better, the skin, light kin skin spread, and hence we have white people and black people. Okay. Interestingly, if you look at Chinese people or people from eastern Siberia, they've got light skins too, but they do it with a different gene. And that's classically the way that natural selection works. Because as we went west into, into Europe and into what's now Russia, uh, one particular gene mutated and was favoured. As we went east into what's now China and Japan, a different gene mutated and is favoured. So we do the same thing, have light skins in different ways. Um, so it's just like that. It wasn't planned, it just happened. So it happens with us too. But really, what about this just another animal thing? Of course, when we think about it, of course, we deal with the terrible climate in quite a different way a way it should, which no other creature can do. We deal with it with technology, with, with knowledge, with understanding. And knowledge and understanding depend on a completely unique attribute to humans, which is language. And it's ironic that the language which Darwin used to illustrate the fact of illustration is really what made us human. No other animal has got language at all. And what language allows you to do is to accumulate your mistakes in a new way. You've got a new kind of genetics. You can tell people about stuff. You don't have to inherit it from you. Okay? You can teach them. Uh, you can put it on the internet even now. Or you can write it down. Um, and people can go to books and learn. And with language we can do wonderful things. And one of the wonderful things we've all done all over the world is go back to the African savannah. Because under these bright lights, it's like an African sun. This is a nice warm room, okay, because it's centrally heated. Um, it's, uh, the city I'm in is rather cold today, but I go outside and it's raining, but I've got a waterproof. So I've returned to the happy days when man lived on the savannah, lived among the chimps. And that ability to do that is a statement that man is unique and completely unlike any other animal that ever has lived or ever will live.